King's English and Archaic Words. My name's Matthew Vashur from Australia and my website is bibleprotector.com. Now each of these are lecture topics in themselves, but basically we're going through four chapters. So the first is that God is the creator and Lord of languages and that there are providences around preparing a language for the world standard Bible. In other words, God has prepared English to convey his concepts of truth. Secondly, the perfect God who lifts up an ensign, that's a standard for the world, he has a global language which is providentially supplied in a uh, for having a perfect Bible in that language, a standard Bible. Thirdly, the language of that Bible, or in particular as we drill in or zoom in on that Bible, is in biblical English. And the specific and precise language of the King James Bible is important. In other words, God has prepared a particular set of words and words with their meaning and, and way of doing grammar in the King James Bible as a particular way to communicate his exact truth. And fourthly, the God of love who communicates to mankind, the King James Bible has been designed for us to understand it. So God has sent his word into the earth for people not to you know, be puzzled about, but to understand. So God is working right now by his spirit in the earth for people to know the truth. So he's wanting the widest amount of people to get the most amount of knowledge from him through understanding the King James Bible as his message to mankind. Okay, so let's go through this. Number one, the Lord of languages, God prepared English. So in Daniel chapter 7 verse 14, it says, And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away in his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Now, people point to this and say, this is talking about Jesus in the future millennial reign of Christ, and that's certainly true. But also the fact that even now and this time in a spiritual way, if you take Bible prophecy as having multiple fulfillments, then you're not just looking at a literal fulfillment of the future, but a spiritual fulfillment even now that spiritually Christ is reigning. He's reigning in heaven right now, because you see it on the right hand of the throne of God. And also the fact that the Holy Ghost is in our hearts and and Christ is the king in our hearts, and that's a spiritual reign. It's not literally visible physically in earth. Um, and therefore, things like God's power into nations and the fact that languages are really being used for the gospel, think about it, in the Reformation time, when the Bible was being translated into other languages, that's like God's dominion in those languages, as it were, and God's people in those languages could respond to his word as part of his kingdom, certainly in a spiritual phase of his kingdom now in this present time. Obviously, not yet the future reign of Christ, which one day will happen, literally, when Jesus is reigning on earth. Okay, so language is designed by God. That's really important. It's not chaotic. It's not um, by chance. Each of the languages of Babel, so when the Tower of Babel happened and the different people were scattered into different directions, those divisions were by family group. It wasn't just random groups of people speaking, oh, you all speak the same language. It wasn't random. It was by people group, by, uh, you know, each family of each, um, you know, of the great, whatever, grandchildren of Ham, Shem and Japheth. Th these families these different people groups, um, they were speaking the same language each. So it wasn't splitting up families. So God knows the migratory pattern of different groups. You know, he's made of uh, one blood, all nations, all men uh, that dwell on the face of the earth. And, you know, he's set their bounds. So God has been in control of that. And God knows about the development of early languages. For example, uh, eventually there was one particular group, one of the grandchildren of Japheth called Ashkenaz, and his people were living in the time of the Hittites. They're still living today, by the way. But they were living in Anatolia, in western Anatolia, and uh, alongside the Hittites, who were in eastern Anatolia. And uh, they were living, for example, in a place that we now know as Troy. The Ashkenaz people, after leaving Troy, because Troy you know, had various... Uh, 
times when it was burnt and and things happen but at some point they left troy and they went into scythia this ashkenaz people now who are these people well by the time of the romans they were the germanic peoples and they were well established in northern europe okay so that's a that's a migrationary pattern that we see but what language were they speaking well we know that the language that certainly part of those people were speaking which were the angles and the saxon they were speaking what was called now we know as old english now the bible was translated into gothic which is a different language a language of the Germ a certain part of the germanic peoples but the bible or scripture was also translated into anglo-saxon now not the whole bible but certainly things like the lord's prayer was we'll get to that in a second so the angles and saxons which are part of the germanic peoples but a um they were a western part of them they were living in what today is called Sax saxony and frisia and and uh, part of jutland or denmark um they went over and invaded into britannia and of course they became the english and set up several kingdoms there and the gospel came from Ireland, you know, was in uh, the Roman Empire at that time, the form of the Roman Empire as it was. Um, but it came from them and eventually through into, um, by a guy called Patrick, into Ireland and from Ireland into the Scotland, Scottish people as it were, um, though they weren't really Scots at the time. Um, but those people there and uh, those people then they sent their evangelists their people to uh, missionaries to go to the anglo-saxons such as in northumbria there was like saint aidan um, preached to the northumbrians and they converted to christianity what were they believing before then they were the you know like the vikings they were believing in odin and thor that's what their saxons and and so on they believed in those gods and they converted to Christianity. So what happened is that the Anglo-Saxon language then got changed. So the word for God in Anglo-Saxon, it meant like one of the Anglo-Saxon gods or Goten even, which is like a word for Woden, the head god or all father in, for the uh, f heathen Anglo-Saxon people. Well, now that word God or God, it was then used to describe the Christian God. So we have the Christianization of their language, but also their concepts get changed. And by the time of King Alfred, who was King of Wessex, one of the um, kingdoms of, of the Anglo-Saxons, and eventually his kingdom took over all the kingdoms. So by the time of his grandson, there was essentially the kingdom of England. Uh, the language of the anglo-saxons had become a christianized language because they were a christianized people now all of this is happening and i'm describing this just because it's a preparation of the language for then the bible to be able to come into it better by having words and understanding of concepts to be able to communicate doctrines so that's really important that's the work of god with these languages so the heathen anglo-saxon language was christianized and was already influenced by christianity thus old english forms of words like ghost, so the Anglo-Saxons would have had one meaning for ghost or heaven. Uh, well, then they had the Christian meaning, like holy ghost and heaven, you know, and the word gospel. Then as you go forward, there was the Norman invasion, which were actually French-speaking people from, from the, the Norse, French-speaking people. They were living in Normandy by that time. And they invaded under William the Conqueror, 1066. They invaded England, and they brought with them the French language. Well, that French language in turn, because French is based on Latin, brought a much stronger Latin influence into the Anglo-Saxon language, or English as we'll call it, and created a language called, or the form of language called Middle English, which then is the language of Chaucer. So words were coined by Wycliffe when he was translating the scripture from the Vulgate, from Latin, into Middle English. And he could use words then, because he had to get words out of um, basically those French uh, roots and use them so that there were words in English that could communicate the words of the scripture and, and doctrine. So words like play, quiet, allegory, adoption, doctrine, zealous, seer, mutter, first fruits, graven image, horror, female, etc. 
In the Reformation, we have William Tyndale's translation into English, and of course he was using the Texas Receptus. So there were still words then, how do we bring from, you know, in, he was translating, say like, you know, Exodus and Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. How, how do we communicate these words in English, these ideas? So he had to create words, invent new words like Passover, atonement, mercy seat, scapegoat, beautiful, housetop, brokenhearted, fisherman, sorcerer, uproar, ungodly, castaway, infidel, seashore, etc. And, you know, even when the Geneva version was made, uh, words were coming into English like network and stargazers. So all of these providential influences were to help English be the best possible language for the Bible, you know, so that sound doctrine can be communicated through the scripture and taught by the language of English. Why? In preparation for a worldwide communication of the gospel. Why? Because English is spread everywhere and therefore the preaching of the gospel can happen because we've got a language that is able to communicate the full depth and breadth of doctrine, and we've got the ability to have the full scripture in English. So isn't this mystical view like, oh, only the true doctrines and true scripture can be in the original language because that's what God used, but actually God prepared English to be able to be a full container or communicating language for these truths, for these concepts. Number two, raising the standard. God prepared the King James Bible. Okay. In Romans chapter 15 and verse 4, it says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. Many people have this doctrine, or many people, some people have this doctrine, um, the Bible is written for its original audience. But that's not right. The Bible was actually written not only for its original audience, but for us today, because that's the real spiritual impact of the scripture, um, is that it's for us. That's what Paul said here in Romans 15 verse 4. It's written for our learning. So yes, we learn from the example about the Jews, you know, the Israelites in the Old Testament, but also that we, through patience, the comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Why? Because we have the scripture and all those doctrines and things, they have importance and meaning for us. Well, the logical implication here is we need to have the language to be able to understand that and we need to have the, um, you know, everything so that it becomes relevant to us and that it can be made known. So it all ties together. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 23 says, Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. So God's spirit or in this case, the word spirit lowercase means he's working to the hearts of men, into your heart even. He'll pour out his spirit or, or knowledge unto you, spiritual knowledge unto you. Well, how is he doing it? Is he doing it just to the time of, you know, Solomon or King Hezekiah's men or whatever? No, he's doing it, well, yes, but he's doing it even for us. He's doing it for all those that his words come to. And it's really important to see that God really is directing the scripture to come to us. Why? His will. I will make known my words unto you. Not you have to learn Greek to get them or you had to be living in the time of the evangelists, you know, the apostles writing, uh, like say Paul, you had to be living in the time of Paul, a contemporary, to get his letter written to your church. Oh, he's written to us. We've got his words made known unto us. No, it's written not just for them, but for us today even now he does make his words known to us that's how he's working through history so he's we've already seen he's designed language for us so that we can have his word of truth and now we're beginning to see that he's set up the king james bible to communicate specifically to us zephaniah chapter 3 verse 9 for then will i turn to the people a pure language that they may all call upon the name of the lord to serve him with one consent now, you could read that in the sense of the Jewish people. You know, they're learning English. Why? Because it's for unity of the faith. It's so that they can have an understanding of the truth. When he says turn to the people, also in, in a New Testament sense, turn to believers having a pure language. Well, what's this pure language? Well, it's not just, oh, well, we're going to all speak English. That's not quite what it must mean. Because when it says a pure language, it's actually talking about 
the language that God uses himself specifically as a biblical language. In other words, yes, you'd have to see the commonality of English in the world if God was designing to have a particular perfect form of the scripture, a standard Bible in English, but that English Bible has to actually be in itself a pure language, biblical English, a particular form of English, unlike any other English, the King James Version. Um, so he's turning to the people general English, so even people in, say, South Korea, whatever, learn English and are learning English. Uh, he's turning to the people English so that they can access the pure language that he's turning to them, which is the King James Bible coming to them, with the result that they may all call upon the name of the Lord. So you will know the name of the Lord properly by having an English Bible to serve him with one consent. So this is actually eliminating divisions in the body of Christ, ultimately, because you have one Bible standard, and therefore, as you align to that, your doctrine is going to get better and better. So that means in time, we should be seeing growth of Christianity in a particular way, a particular unity of Christianity, not divisive or divisions of Christianity. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Well, that doesn't work if everyone's bringing, oh, you bring a living Bible and you're bringing the NIV 1984 and you're bringing whatever else to church. How can you be with one mouth speaking the same thing? You know, these, these different Bible versions and translations are differing to each other in concepts wildly, relatively speaking. I mean, you know, you don't know whether Jesus was born of just a young woman or a virgin because these translations and, and so on are changing so radically these precise points of doctrine among themselves. So the only answer is to have one pure standard, one Bible, and that's a King James Version, the translation that was made in 1611, um, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Well, coming to unity of doctrine requires a, a standard that we're going to agree on first. So if we're coming together to the same standard, then in time we can believe God's work towards us all, all believers having proper doctrine. That's a, a future fulfillment still for believers before the Lord uh, take us away. And uh, that, that's really important, that this is what he's out working towards. Well, we have a same standard Bible. That, that's a really important step. And as people are recognizing it, and whether people have come from a Baptist background or whatever, if they're recognizing we've got the common standard, that's the first step. And then we can come together more and more based on that. If you're believing the same scripture, then when people are reading out the scripture, there's not a division on what the scripture is. So then it comes down to then the, the next step would be getting the interpretations right of how do we interpret scripture? How do we rightly divide scripture? And I know obviously there's lots of work that needs to happen there, but we need to get the first step right, which is let's all get on the same page with the same Bible, so to speak. That is to say that we all agree and use the King James Version as God's standard for us all as true believers. Isaiah chapter 28 verse 11, For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. Now, the stammering lips part can talk about what happened at Pentecost, but he says, and, so it's something else, another tongue, sing, singular tongue, not tongues as in, you know, speaking tongues like on the day of Pentecost, but one particular language he's talking about. So how is he going to speak to this people by one language, except there's a world language with a particular Bible that is um, able to communicate the gospel to the people, both to the Jewish people and to people of the planet Earth, uh, by this new one language. Well, when I say new, as in another language. And uh, that is obviously not Greek, and it wasn't Hebrew. It's a future language to that to the Bible times, and it has to be English because it wasn't accomplished by Greek, so therefore it must yet be accomplished by 
English and it is being accomplished by that, has been already being accomplished by it. Let's now look at what the King James Bible translators themselves said, because it's going to give us a lot of insight as to the rightness of the King James Bible in relation to its accuracy and conceptual uh, communication, like that you can rely on it. They said, Neither did we think much to consult the translators or commentators, Chaldee, Hebrew, uh, Syrian, Greek, or Latin, no, nor the Spanish, French, Italian, or Dutch. Neither did we disdain to revise that which we had done and to bring back to the anvil that which we had hammered. So they not only consulted various sources, such as other commentators and other translations in making the King James Bible, but they also themselves kept on going back and went in a cycle of improvement, which is how they set up making the King James Bible. I'm not going to go into detail on that, but the fact is, it's tying back to this idea that the language um, has been set up deliberately. It's not like, oh, the word Easter in there, it's a mistake in the King James Bible. No, every word has been deliberately chosen. That's, that's what we're getting at. Another point they said, for by this means it cometh to pass that whatsoever is sound already, the same will shine as gold more brightly, being rubbed and polished. Also, if anything be halting or superfluous or not so agreeable to the original, the same may be corrected and the truth set in place. So they're really talking about getting the King James Bible right. Well, did they accomplish that or not? Well, the thing is, they did accomplish that. They did improve. They did get it right. So if someone's trying to make some new translation today or do new textual work today, they're actually going against the gold standard now. You know, they're corrupting. They, the tra translators also said, Yet for all that, as nothing is begun and perfected at the same time, and the latter thoughts are thought to be the wiser, so if we building upon their foundation that went before us, and being holpen by their labours, do endeavour to make that better which they left so good, i.e. William Tyndale, etc., no man, we are sure, hath cause to mislike us. They, we persuade ourselves, if they were alive, would thank us. So they're actually improving the Bible translation. So, and it's a more accurate translation. It's exactly accurate. That's what they were aiming for. In other words, the use of English, the language was coming into its primal or, or into its ultimate form of biblical English through their work. And now at last, by the mercy of God and the continuance of our labors, it being brought unto such a conclusion as that we have great hopes that the Church of England shall reap good fruit thereby. And that means that Christianity reaps the good fruit thereby. It, of course, has come to pass that we have reaped much good. They said, for that out of the original, or sorry, original sacred tongues, together with comparing of the labours, both in our own and other foreign languages, of many worthy men who went before us, there should be one more exact translation of the Holy Scriptures into the English tongue. Can you see that their Bible is the final standard? One more exact translation. You can't get any more than that. Bergen said, John William Bergen said, known also as the Dean, Dean Bergen, the Bible is none other than the voice of him that sitteth upon the throne. Every book of it, every chapter of it, every verse of it, Every word of it, every syllable of it, where do we stop? Every letter of it is the direct utterance of the Most High. Well, he had a high view of Scripture. And, he said, the plain fact being that the men of 1611 produced a work of real genius, seizing with generous warmth the meaning and intention of the sacred writers and perpetually varying the phrase as they felt or fancied that evangelists or and apostles would have varied it had they had to express themselves in English. So the translators, according to Bergen, were acting like as if the Bible was written in English to start with or were using English like as if Paul the Apostle would have been using English had he been writing in English. That's how he was viewing the King James Bible and uh, that's how he should see it. It's if... Uh, there's no barriers or cultural contaminations or loss of information between God and us today. You know, that's, that's a very 
fake approach of a lot of uh, modernist interpretation. They talk about things like the principalizing bridge and, you know, the, there's such a cultural difference and between the near eastern culture of the first century or blah 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 and us today that we you know are somehow misunderstanding the bible that's all fake that's all wrong what's true is as paul said what was written a four time was written for our learning the holy ghost is actually getting it to us he's designed our language english he's designed that the king james bible is exactly exactly accurate and a pure language bible so that we can have it bergen said uh, it would really seem as if the revisionists of 1611 had considered it a graceful achievement to vary English phrase, even on occasions where a marked identity of expression characterizes the original Greek, when we find them turning goodly apparel in St. James 2 verse 2 into gay clothing in verse 3, we can but conjecture that they conceive themselves at liberty to act exactly as St. James himself would possibly have acted had he been writing English. In other words... The translators were using English words as freely as if that's how the apostles themselves would have freely cho chosen how to use English. So the nuance, the very sense, the very, you know, how it sounds, how it runs, the, the meter, the, the um, euphonics, you know, the sound itself, the pattern of, of how it's spoken. But then it speedily becomes evident that at the bottom of the, all this, there existed in the minds of the revisionists of 1611, because he calls them revisionists because they're revising Tyndale and Geneva and Bishop's Bible and all that. There existed in the minds of the revisionists of 1611 a profound, shall we not rather say a prophetic, consciousness that the fate of the English language itself was bound up with the fate of their translation. So that's a pretty big statement to say that the English language going as a worldwide language was actually completely tied up with the fact of the King James Bible being made. In other words, English language is like a handmaid to the Bible itself and that those two go together. In other words, God has designed English for the Bible and God has designed the King James Bible to convey to the world through the English language. So when he talks about a pure tongue, a pure language, He's really talking about the English of the Bible being able to be conveyed to the world in, in English, which, of course, everyone speaks a different kind of English um, as far as you know their accents and whatever and uh, in different countries. But there is a pure standard, the Bible, which is the same for everyone across the planet Earth. Number three, biblical English. God's designed uh, conceptual precision. So this is where we get into the language of the Bible itself and how each word, each meaning is very exact. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20. Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. This thing about teaching them to observe all all things whatsoever I've commanded you means we have to have a Bible that doesn't have anything missing out of it. We can't have missing verses or missing words. We can't have textual variations that are, you know, losing parts of Scripture that doesn't make sense. Um, Jesus is saying we should be able to observe all things, you know, basically what he said, what he wants us to know. Romans 10, verse 17 to 19 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have not they heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth. Talking about the Old Testament, their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. So the scripture is indeed going into all the earth, into all the world. And that's being fulfilled not in Hebrew, but in English. Romans 16 verse 26, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. In other words, for the gospel to have its impact, the gospel requires the scripture also coming into all nations. And how is that possible? Because we know that it's literally 
um, the fact today that English is the most widespread language, we know that we have a perfect Bible with the King James Bible. So how's God making known his truth to all the nations? How is it possible that nations could convert to the gospel? Because the King James Bible is here. So what's happened since 1611? Well, in the King James Bible itself, we know that through different editions, there was the correction of typography you know, typographical errors and proper copy editing that took place, which includes things like the standardization of English grammar and spellings. We know that there's an improvement in technology because when you're setting type by hand, you know, each each letter is a piece of metal you're putting into a plate and then you're stamp, you know, stamping down one of those old fashioned printing presses back what they were using. I mean, that was a very slow process, you know, smear ink on it or rub it on and then, uh, you know, wind the thing down or push the thing down, print onto a piece of paper, you know, lift it up, put the next piece of paper. I mean, that's very cumbersome. So better technology days like computerized and digital printing and so on. So we have a ability to get it uh, out in even its very presentation most accurately. In Johnson's Dictionary of 1755, there was a standardization of English spelling well, it's not by accident, but Blaney's editorial work was needed, which happened in 1769, which is just a few short years after that. And we have editorial accuracy today with the pure Cambridge edition of the King James Bible. So talking about we don't have typos anymore because we've been able to eliminate typos and we've got accuracy as far as standard spellings of words and things like that, not based on a worldly standard, but based on a biblical English standard because of this process that's happened even in English itself. So every word, every letter, every punctuation mark has meaning, has a purpose, and therefore word order, word choices, every word, every capital letter and lowercase letter, and every comma, and whatever, every mark, has a purpose in the King James Bible and has a meaning. So every mark, every dot, every tittle, everything matters. Matthew chapter 5 verse 18 says, For verily I say unto you, to heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Now people have interpreted this in the general sense, meaning um, every promise or uh, type, every sort of um, implication of the Old Testament will be fulfilled with Jesus and will be fulfilled in the second coming and whatever and everything must come to pass and that's true but the basis of all these promises are that it's in a written form law itself is in a written form I mean you think about the constitution of your country you think about laws it's based on lawyers are arguing about you know words meaning of words letters commas I mean people have I've heard have won or lost a court case based on a comma that's a that's a fact so uh the scripture itself is the ultimate form of that so here's the standard here's the law of god now he's saying not one jot in other words god needs to have a precise perfect law how is he judging us he's not judging us on his own mere intentions no he's actually laid out this is my standard which you have so in the last days that's what we're measured by on the last day for example the final judgment for example we're measured on that standard. We're measured on the, the very scripture itself being as a written law. So God in, and in his work, Jesus and, and all things that are happening in history are fulfilling every precise promise and every precise thing of his scripture. And point number four is know the truth. God wants us to know the truth. And knowing truth means, of course, communicating by language which is made up of words and words have meaning the real reason for hard words and dark sayings so let's understand why are there some difficult you know words and passages in the king james bible so detractors say difficulty and unintelligibility oh no you know you can't understand the bible properly because there's obsolete words there's words that have fallen out of the language and archaic language um, this is not really right. It's largely just propaganda. You see, first of all, words in use are not obsolete, which means since the King James Bible is in existence, is in use right now, there are actually no obsolete words there because we're still using those words. Now, there might be some rare, unusual words, but they're not actually lost words because meanings are not lost. And that's really important. Now, a 
uneducated person or a person new, a person that hasn't learnt yet, might not know a meaning of a word. But that doesn't mean they can't know. <laughs> no, the Holy Ghost is here. The, the teachers in the church, books are written. We're here to learn. Difficult words are designed to encourage learning. We're supposed to know these precise words and their precise meanings. You see, it's actually about Okay, that's a difficult word, but that word has a particular meaning that you can't just use another word for because only that particular hard word has that exact meaning that is needed. So it's really important that we keep those so-called archaic words, which aren't really archaic, those, those special words, because they have those special meanings that are required for us to have, actually have the full truth. Now, another kind of detraction that we hear from a certain uh, set of uh, biscuits, as we see here, uh, false friends. And this is a made-up thing. And this is um, what could be def uh, defined as language that doesn't mean what you think it means. When he means you think it means, or the detractors say this, what they're counting on is your gullibility. In other words, you're an uneducated person, you read something in the King James Bible and you don't get it because... You didn't realize that it wasn't meaning what you thought it was meaning because you didn't really know. Well, cases of this are greatly exaggerated. Most of the cases aren't true. But yes, it can happen. You read the Bible and cause, just because you don't know, you might misunderstand something. That definitely can happen. Well, again, aren't there teachers in the church? Don't we grow in knowledge? Don't we understand? I'll tell you right now a personal uh, thing. For many, many years, when we were talking about the Lord's Supper and Jesus said, drink ye all of it. I thought it meant drink all the wine, like drink all of the wine. But clearly he wasn't meaning that. He was meaning drink all of you of this, all of the people present at the, at the time, drink of this cup. So it's just a wrong assumption that I had because I was not yet fully as educated. And, you know, we learn, we're all learning and I only learnt that very recently, and I'd been reading the King James Bible for, you know, something over 25 years, and I only just learnt that. Now, people might think, well, how could you not know that? But look, all of us are learning, and the point here is we can learn. The knowledge is not hidden from us. Now, was I led astray, or, you know, was there a false um, doctrine that might have been established on that misunderstanding? Well, Possibly, you know, I would have to drain my communion glass to fulfill the scripture if, as I had wrongly interpreted. But, I mean, that's a pretty minor thing and certainly not a salvation issue. However, I understand the passage, so it's clearly not a problem. And the point here actually is, if you're using a modern translation, there's so much butchering of words and meanings that there's all kinds of fake and wrong ideas they have, even from the very first verses of the Bible. I mean, is the Holy Ghost moving upon the waters or is he hovering on the waters? I mean, these people, they've got whole different concepts, whole different understandings that they're teaching in their modern translations. So how to understand? Well, we approach the Bible, the King James Bible, with willingness of heart. Like, we can learn. I want to learn. We believe that the Holy Ghost is present and he guides us into all truth. So he really is doing that. Your study. You compare scripture with scripture. We have a, what's called an inbuilt dictionary of the Bible. In other words, you can see in one passage, even in the, maybe the same passage or by comparing passages, you can interpret the scripture and find out, oh, well, that word must mean this because I can see from what it's talking about. There's also the judicious use of other sources such as and, and this is really important, sound teachers, uh, that you should be listening to sound teachers, yes. Proper helps, godly commentaries, a good dictionary, etc. Now, you don't have to do those things. Sound teachers, yes, probably you, sh you should be doing those things. But those other things, like looking at the dictionary, that's optional, but that's not a problem if you need to do that. So, archaic words... That's I don't like to use the word archaic. I will say so-called archaic words. And they're words um, which just are things that are not much used. But what they say archaic words are really aren't necessarily archaic words. They might be just things that aren't 
current anymore. For example, musical instruments that used to be common or used to exist that now aren't used very much or items of clothing that are now not in fashion. So, for example, you have the King James uh, word like tabaret um, or tabre, um, which means a timbrel or um, dulcimer, which is a zither played with little hammers. Well, that still exists. A sackbutt, which is an early trombone or tire, which is a kind of a mitre that you wear on your head. A wimple. What does that word mean? Well, it's a, a headpiece like a habit. Well, that was a fashion in medieval times even. Ouches. What are they? Well, they're jewel badges sewn onto a garment. Certainly in Tudor times, they had those. Bosses. Well, they're a knob on the front of the shield. Well, we don't use shields much, so obviously we don't have those. So that word isn't very relevant in that meaning. Charger, which is a large plate, which is smaller than a platter. Well, that's still in use today because weddings have chargers. Um, Scrip, which means a small bag or a pouch. Uh, and so on. Other words, I'm not going to go into all those. Um, archaic words that are just old spellings like knops for knobs or tatches for attaches, as in attachments. Um, emeralds for hemorrhoids. Fat, as in wine fat, for wine vat. I mean, they're not really archaic. They're just, you know, older words or things not currently in use or fashion so much. And it's not hard to learn these things. It's not like heaps of words. It's not like the, the Bible's full of this. It's just in places here and there. So what about archaic words which are found in medieval and fantasy stories? As in, uh, you can read a children's story or whatever and find these words like um, pate or pate, the pate, the top of the head, uh, with, which means thin twigs which can tie things up, um, and so on, other words which I'm not going to go into there. Um, words which you can guess quite easily, like earring, which is ploughing, or scrabbled, which is scratching around like with your fingers, in rocks, for example, like the game Scrabble, which is named after that exactly. Swaddle, well, that's actually still a current word, um, you know, raising, uh, wrapping up a baby. I won't keep going with that. But anyway, you can get the idea. So there are sometimes a Latinate word and a Saxonate word in the Bible, which seem to be very similar, but might have a slight nuance of difference. And that's really important. Um, we know there's difference between these words and yet they're similar. For example, sucker and help, similitude and likeness, marriage and a wedding, uh, transgression and sin, desert, wilderness, testimony, witness. They definitely have different meanings. Uh, tabernacle, tent. Well, <laughs> they have different meanings too, but are similar. Uh, remission, forgiveness. So remission means like cancellation. Um, flesh, carnal, gentile, heathen, charity, love. Again, different, similar, but different meanings. I mean, love might be, uh, or one might be a subset of the other, like charity. Um, and of course, not to be confused with just the modern meaning of the word charity, which is like, um, you know, giving alms or secondhand goods shops or something. But charity meaning true love in action. Sanctify or hallow, conceal or hide, sufficient or enough labor or work, castle or hold, etc., etc. What about this? Okay, so you've heard probably people say, now, what about the and ye and these words? Well, they have all got particular meaning. It's not just random. For example, when it's got a T, these pronouns are talking about the singular. And when it's a Y, it's talking about the second, um, I should say third person, or the plural. So, for example, um, the pronoun subject, thou, one person, you, multiple people. Pronoun object, unto thee, that's unto one person, unto ye, unto multiple people. Possessive subject, thy, whatever the thing is you have. Or the plural, as in a group's thing, your, whatever it is. And the possessive object, that thing which is thine, one person's, or that thing which is yours, a group of people's. So in Exodus chapter 8 verse 3, and here we see another thing we see with biblical English. And I'll just read this verse. And the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into thine house, and, unto thy, and into thy bedchamber, and upon thy bed, and into the house of thy servants, and upon thy people and into thine ovens 
and into thy kneading troughs. Can you see that when a word starts with H, it'll be thine and not thy? When a word starts with O, like A, E, I, O and U, it'll be thine and not thy. But do you know not every example of words starting with H have thine in front of it? Sometimes it could be thy. Could it be thine house or thy house? Sometimes it is. So there's even variations in the King James Bible on that. Or thy hand or thine hand. So there's more than just that rule of how words are used and and what letter then follows. So it's it's somewhat complex, but it all makes sense. So the so-called archaic language is actually very precise. And it's actually an asset for accurate communication in English. So if you just got you and yours like you know, a modern translation has, they're just missing out on such a, an accurate way of communicating specific or specificality, whatever the word is, um, specificity of, of concepts, the nuance, the very sense. So this language of the King James Bible, and they might laugh at it and say, well, it sounds strange and old and whatever, is, is actually for a purpose and it's very important. Okay, so let's keep going here very quickly now. This is for God's intended message in the original languages to us today. So when we see a Bible word like unicorns, we can say that probably means rhinoceroses. And when we see the word dragons, outside of the kind of poetic or symbolic use of the word dragons, like when we're talking about literal dragons in the Old Testament, it's talking about dinosaurs. And when we see sneezings, we don't say, well, that must mean sneezings but it means the fiery belches of um, a particular kind of uh, sea dragon, for example. Isaiah 14 verse 29 says, Rejoice not thou whole Palestina. Well, Palestina we know is a place, Palestine, because the rod of him that smote thee is broken, for out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice. Well, that might mean a crocodile. That's entirely possible. And his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent. So we can see there that even these kinds of reptiles existed in Bible times. Now the point is that the modern detractors point at words like unicorns and dragons and cockatrices and so on. And they say, oh, look at this mythology or whatever. But no, we're talking here about actual real creatures, actual real things. And that the Bible is God's communication to us. So it's really important to come with a believing approach rather than some scoffing, mocking approach. There is finally this concept of glistering truths, words which seem alike one another, but they have a distinct meaning. So the word dureth has a different subtlety of meaning to the word endureth, or defense to fenced, or minish to diminish, or in damage to damage, or where to aware. Most importantly, some examples I'll quickly br briefly elucidate father and further so father means when the choice is between near and far father like between choice of one or the other or further which means by degrees more far so you can go down the road and then you can go a bit further um, so that's the actual distinction of meaning there um, in sample and example. So in samples, obviously something that you take into your heart and understand within you, whereas example is something that you look upon as an example. So these are actually different words with different meanings. Now the words meanings can be very similar. The words themselves are very similar, but it's the precision of language of biblical English. And that's what you lose when you go to a modern translation because modern day people don't have a conception of this utter accuracy like you see with the King James Bible. So therefore it is a standard. So here's the point I'd like to get to as a conclusion. Trust that God got it right providentially through the hands of all, well first the translators, but through the printers, through the editors, through the commentators of the King James Bible, God has got it right to us today. And secondly, as far as accuracy of even words, not only do we have accuracy of words, we can rely on every word, but even on the basis of the pure Cambridge edition idea that we've got the typos uh, fixed up, we've got the, the standard spellings and everything of biblical English. Now I'm just going to do a tiny little advertisement here on the left hand side 
a century of the pure Cambridge edition. You can get that book on my website, see on my blog. Um, that talks about the King James Bible being printed in from Cambridge in the last hundred years and about that. So you can find out about that. That's my latest book there uh, to look at. My website is BibleProtector.com. God bless.